you need to know your audience, but really know your audience. You, there's so much information out there that is that is free. And some of it is, there is some really great information that's paid as well, but there's a lot of free information out there that you can really use to really, really dig into your audience. Welcome to the B2B Digitize Podcast, where leaders of B2B technology startups and scale-ups learn how to use digital transformation to differentiate, educate, build trust, improve competitive positioning, close sales faster without compromise, and scale revenue growth. Now here's your host, Joshua Feinberg from SP Home Run. Hi, I'm Joshua Feinberg from the B2B Digitized podcast, and I have a very special guest here with me today. I'm being joined by Andy Young from Skeleton in Nottingham in Northern England. Um, Andy is a strategic account manager with a company that specializes in video strategy, and video, overall video marketing. Andy, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for joining me today. Hi, Joshua. Yeah, thanks very much for having us on. I'm really excited to, uh, to get on here and share some, uh, some things from a video marketing perspective. I'm excited as well, because when people ask me what are some of the biggest changes that are happening in digital marketing right now, or what probably within five years is just going to be known as marketing, video is almost always in the top five of things that just enable any kind of business to educate and, and build trust. So I'm super excited to have you on the podcast. But the first place I'd like to start is for you to introduce us a little bit to your background. How did you get to your current role at Skeleton? Did you always know that you wanted to get into video or is this something that happened kind of happenstance? Um, yeah, so video has always um, interested me. Back when in a previous, previous career, previous life, I worked in the craft beer industry in the, in the UK. And um, so we used to have a lot of live bands playing our bar. So we always used to um, try and support the local music scene. So we used to make videos and record um, like unplugged um, sets. And so we're quite into, into the video side of things then. And then as my career progressed, I moved into a full service marketing agency. And then it became one of those things where I was really passionate about video. Really what you said, obviously, video is very, very important. And what you can achieve with video that you can't achieve with other mediums kind of drew me further into the video world. Um, and then um, I saw an opportunity at Skeleton and Skeleton are the, are the best best agency in the area for video, motion graphics, animation. And so it was just like a, a no brainer to take an opportunity there and, and dive headlong into it. And I thought I knew a, a little bit about video before joining and it turns out I knew very, very little, but since then it's been a, um, a great learning curve and um, yeah, and it, what we can achieve with video from a B2B perspective is always changing, always evolving, and there's always challenges, but that's what kind of keeps it exciting and keeps, keeps the industry uh, moving along. Must be really fascinating too, to come from that background of craft beer and working with bands, because if I think back to my childhood, like the people that were in video were a lot of times in entertainment. And a lot of times a milestone was actually recording a video. It wasn't one of these things where everyone said, you know, someday I'm just going to create uh, YouTube videos or content to help grow my ordinary professional services business or my manufacturing business or my healthcare practice or what have you. But uh, it seems we're go we've been going through a period over the last 10, 15, 20 years where literally everyone can be a, a rock star to a certain degree of their own space <laughs> or their own kind of, uh, kind of business. Yeah, 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 definitely, and I, I, and it, 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 it is such a, yeah, such a strange way um, in, into video. But you're right, and I think because because video, what you can capture with video is just so vast, it becomes like a second nature interest to what you're interested in, and then then that kind of grows into a passion. And then if you're like me, you like a lot of tech as well. It kind of really draws you in. <laughs> Bro, it just being so unusual for people to even have access to it. And I grew up in dating myself a little bit in the 1980s. I remember a school project where we created a fictitious bubblegum company and we created this camp. And it was really unusual at the time to storyboard and script this out and everything like that. And it probably wouldn't be till a good 15, 20 years later, maybe five years before YouTube in maybe the late 90s, early 2000s, where it got to the point where um, it would be routine and not uh, something crazy or special for kids to have a project like that in school. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, it, and it's great nowadays. Obviously, everyone's got a camera in the pocket. So hopefully it's just going to harness that kind of desire to create, record things. Obviously, social media, it's so much easier to get that out there. And I do think that encourages people. And 
and the, I say there's such a broad range of content out there and there's some really, really great content um, as well for all sorts of audiences from a B2C and a B2B perspective. So yeah, it's only going to get better, but I think, I'm sure we'll cover it later, but I think it's going to slowly start to change in, in, in certain directions though as well from a video and content point of view. So from where you sit, what advice would you offer to someone that is brand new to digital marketing in a B2B context and is thinking about making a significant investment in video? What's your advice for a beginner that's just getting started? I, I think it's probably in, in, in marketing full stop. I think it's all about knowing your, knowing your audience. And obviously, I know that goes without saying, but people do say that you need to know your audience but really know your audience. You, there's so much information out there that is that is free. And some of it is, there is some really great information that's paid as well, but there's a lot of free information out there that you can really use to really, really dig into your audience. Um, and I know some people think, oh, there's a lot of stuff that's B2C. There's a lot of B2B stuff as well. Um, I think if you're targeting specific companies, you can look at company statements, you can look at what they're posting on LinkedIn. You can look at what the key individuals are posting on LinkedIn. You can look at their competitors, see what they're doing. And you can just really, really dig into it. And I do, I do, and I do it quite a, quite a lot with our clients. So I, have a, um, I use Trello, so I have a little checklist that I run through of what I'm looking at from an audience perspective, just to make sure I've got a base level um, understanding of who their audience is. And that's something that never goes away. And that's something that's valuable to to any to any marketeer to stay on top of who that audience is and obviously we've seen some rapid changes in the last two years of what what excites those audience where do they hang out who are they influenced by what value can you actually bring to them and i think when you're first joining marketing you think you might you might know that but there's always more to learn and you've got to stay on top of it as well yeah i think that's such a huge point of knowing the audience and picking your battles, deciding to be more specific as opposed to broad, because there's just so much competition for people's attention. I always, I'm talking to clients about like research techniques when building personas and ideal client profiles. I always tell them that if you can come across a video of a target prospect and watch that video as your source, as opposed to reading a blog post they wrote or reading a news release where they're quoted, you not only get their words, you get the body language, the intonation. It's the next best thing to sitting face to face and having coffee with them. Yeah, I, I, exactly. It, it it does bring so much so much out there, and that's something that we kind of do internally here as well. When we when we might be looking out to new prospects or working with an organisation and wanting to introduce ourselves to some of the wider team, we'll record a video rather than saying "Hi, nice to meet you" via email or anything like that. We will come out and we'll record a video. It's a bit more personable, but it shows a lot more than what you can do from text or static imagery. Yeah, it's just it's, you know, they always say what's it a picture is worth a 1000 words and a 1000 pictures is worth a there's just something that comes across with video where if you watch enough content from that person, by the time you meet them face to face, you feel like you know them already. Yeah, and it, it just makes it and it just makes it so much easier. And, and obviously, in a world where it's a lot harder to have face to face meetings. I mean, we have a uh, we have a lot of clients based in um, based in Europe and also based in North America. So for us, getting getting face to face time is very very challenging. Um, so a video is 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 the best way to best way to do that for us and to kind of build a lot of familiarity. And obviously, it's a big part of B of B two B is um, building up trust through all your through all your different types of communication. And a video is a great way to do that. Show there's real people. This is a real company. And we're doing and this is how we can help you. Type of thing. That's great advice is really understanding the audience and what makes them tick and what their motivations are and really digging behind the scenes. What advice would you offer to someone that has been in digital marketing or uh, has been trying to grow a business using digital marketing for 10 years or so, and they've been through a rough year. Um, we've all been through a rough year in the last year or two. And uh, maybe their company has experienced a lot of client churn. Maybe there's been a lot of turnover on their team. Maybe there's been a lot of personal hardships and they're trying to reset and get back on track. Give, keeping in mind that they're trying to grow business to business, they're thinking very seriously about video. What advice would you give to someone who's much further along in their journey, but really needs to reset? I think there's, um, well, there's a couple of things is that there's people with a lot more experience than me. So 
um, I'm cautious about teaching them to kind of suck eggs. But I think a couple of things that jump out at me is, as, as I said, revisit your audience. Again, I know we said that for the uh, people just getting in, but with the way things have been over the last two years, revisit your audience. And again, that doesn't necessarily have to be something that, you, that you're paying for. You can, you've got um, an existing client base. Talk to them about what's working for them. How can you help them better? And just trying to really understand what value you're bringing in, in, in this post-COVID world. Um, I think that's really important. And also as well, what I would say is don't get caught up in um, any short termism. So still, you've still got to think about the long game. Like a lot of people now are just focused purely on ROI and ROI is very important because there's obviously a lot of pressure from um, CMOs and the general C-suite for that money to be, um, for any budget to be spent as effectively as possible and has to be shown a return. It's more so than ever. And things like brand awareness and share of voice have taken a back seat. And this is covered in Gartner's latest the CMO report. And what, what you could do is you could just focus too much on the short term. And then when things start to recover and bounce back, you're playing catch up with some of the other brands within the industry who've still taken time to invest in their um, brand awareness and brand image. So I think that would be that like the best thing I could say is don't, don't panic and but still try and maintain that long-term vision while still battling the short-term challenges. And the hardest part of that is bringing in, uh, bringing along internal stakeholders of your company along with you. But by having a clear plan of how you see that moving forward, I think that's, I think that's the best, best chance you've got of making, um, making it a success. And it's always, I do feel so sorry for <laughs> marketing teams because it's always the first budget to get cut. And it's always hard for that budget to ever recover back because generally what happens is you have to do so much with such a little budget that if you do achieve that moving forward, that's going to be your budget because you managed to do it in those, in those tough times. So again, setting that bigger picture of how you might see this, how your marketing might look in three to five years, I think will really, really help bring those internal stakeholders who might be blocking the need to still take care of brand awareness and your brand goodwill. Yeah, that's such a huge challenge in so many companies is there and the internal stakeholders who are in favor of what you're looking to do and the internal stakeholders that are fighting the status quo. And when you brought up Gartner, it makes me think of the, all the different research of people having these digital buyers journeys now where they're typically 60, 70, 80% of the way through the research process before they're open to having a sales conversation. So the sales team is totally frustrated that they spend a lot of time begging for these 15 minute meetings when their prospects really just wanna do a lot of research. They're trying to, to learn different things and to have access to different resources of which video is definitely part of that <clears throat> part of that overall mix. And yet you're battling for, hey, you know, the company just put another two or three full-time headcounts into cold calling people when prospects don't wanna be cold called, they wanna, largely have a, a very different kind of journey where video could be a huge part of that, but you're battling for uh, resources. Yeah, we, we've seen that previously with a, um, with a company who do high value, it's high value projects um, that they work on in the engineering space. And they're dealing with um, some of the engineers who generally are a um, new, new, straight out of university. And they're probably about five years into their engineering career. And they realize that, trying to get a meeting with these people is quite tough. They would rather spend their time learning as much as they can about it in their own, at their own pace. And so we ended up creating like a 15 minute, quite a long video, but it was, it was a bit slight like commitment video is it's almost like an on-demand webinar type thing where you could watch it for 15 minutes and learn in more detail. So it's a little precursor to the, to the, to the sales meeting. And then that empowered the individual, the prospect, so that when they went in that call, they knew the right questions to be asking of the company. And I think a big part of it is that people want to feel empowered when they're decision making. And so giving them the right information at the right stage in the right format is absolutely vital. Um, so I would, I would, again, that comes back to that audience and learning what, and learning what they want. And I think you made a good point as well about sometimes there's, there's disjoints between marketing and sales. And I think if you start to bring that gap closer together, I think that will help massively. If you're bringing real data, real insights to the sales team and communicating what you're trying to do to make their life easier, 
and to make the customer journey a lot more fluid, that's ultimately what you're, what you're trying to do. And I think if you work together on that, that again, that's another thing that can really, 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 really help. Yeah, I'm such a big fan of that idea of having the 10, 15, 20 minute video, 30 minute video, whatever it is that you give to someone ahead of a meeting because many times there's other stakeholders that should be at that meeting, but for whatever reason, it's not being prioritized. Maybe there's political battles internally as to who's going to actually own the project. But when it's a video asset, they can pass it along and the silent decision makers and the silent influencers and everything within the same company can many times be looped into what's going on. And then I, you know, I, I saw in preparing for our interview today, I saw in your LinkedIn feed, you had mentioned using uh, hosting like Wistia and being able to uh, understand where people are in the journey and just love the idea of being able to know that, gee, you know, I asked this person to watch this video ahead of the meeting. Did they watch it? Did they watch all 15 minutes of it or did they stop after 90 seconds? And does it show that they're watching it multiple times and yeah. all that stuff is so incredibly valuable for contextualizing the sales process? Exactly. And that's with Wist, you can even send specific links to certain people, prospects as well, if you really wanted to kind of gauge how that individual or the, how that company is using that, that video. But one thing that we did recently for the, um, you might have seen it, the, the Platinum Hermes Award that we won, um, part of that campaign, what we actually did, we did a long form video, which was against all the industry best practice, but our audience needed that information. So we created a longer video and we could see what parts people with Wistia, we could see what parts people were re-watching. And then so we knew they were, they were hooked on that point. They were going back and looking at it or a point later where they were look, again looking at it, but it was worded slightly strangely looking back. So it's like, right, we need to explain that a little bit better now. Now we understand a little bit more about what this video is about. It's been out there for three months and the messaging's changed because it was quite a, a fluid campaign because it was about Brexit. And so that was an absolute nightmare for anyone navigating what was going to be happening. And this was a logistics company as well. So things were moving. So by going back and being able to look at what people were rewatching, we could define, yep, yeah, that's a key point. Or that is a point where we maybe need to take the jargon out of that and make, lay it on a little bit more simple. And then we've got those insights. And again, it just smoothed that sales process up. No end because that customer, the client, prospect, whatever you want to call them, was getting all that information in the right way. And then that made it so much easier for the sales team to then convert because they're not having to sit through a presentation and explain all that to them. They can get focused on how can I best help this prospect? It just makes life so much easier and just so much smoother. It's an interesting uh, thing too, because there's so many of these old wives tales around that, like, oh, people will never watch a long video. They'll never read a long sales letter. They'll never read a long ebook. The reality though, is you have to know your buyer personas. It's entirely possible that the perfect person that you want to be consuming all 15 minutes goes all the way through that advances to an opportunity to become an internal champion. And maybe there's a secondary persona in that same company who's the decision maker. They're not going to watch all 15 minutes but maybe from like one minute and 13 seconds to two minutes and 40 seconds is a clip that you pull out. So is that whole repurposing movement where you take the longer video and break it up into smaller bite-sized digestible things. But I think just being super aware of that audience and where they are, it just makes such an enormous difference with being deliberate about all this. Exactly. It is wherever they're on their journey. And you make an, you make an interesting point there about the decision maker might not look at all the um, might not watch the whole thing, but pick out certain parts. And that's, again, another reason on this video, we used chapter markers on Wistia. So you could clearly see, you could clearly jump to the part of X, Y, Z. So you knew straight away that that's what I want to get to. And I've seen it more recently where people are uploading a video, but then underneath they've got five little sub videos that have the chapters and like the timestamp. So when you, they're all technically the same video, but when you click it, it moves towards that timestamp underneath. And it's just a clever way of making things as easy as possible for the viewer. And especially when it's a chunky bit of content, that's like 10, 15, 20 minutes, as you say. I've noticed even outside of Wistia that YouTube seems to be emphasizing that a lot as well now, the whole idea of setting up chapters with the time codes and the descriptions. And we just started experimenting with that maybe a month or two ago. And it's at the general feeling is that it positively influences not only 
the engagement rate to get people to watch longer, but it will positively influence how a video shows up on a search engine results page because it's shown as another piece of metadata similar to like a, a snippet. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that, again, that's a, an often thing that's overlooked is obviously the video description. It's your chance to signpost it as easy as possible to Google what is actually in there. And, and, and you are right by putting in those, putting in those markers. Sometimes you might just skip, I say, just skip the beginning because it's, for example, your podcast, I'd, I'm not like with, with like, if you've got an intro on there, people sometimes just skip it just because they've heard it before. There's nothing wrong with it. They've just heard it before and they just want to get straight into the meat of this episode. So things like that, as easy as you can make it for people, the better, really. Yeah, it makes a huge difference. It's, it's interesting. I was talking to a client about a month or two ago and they were brand new to podcasting and they're like, the video needs to be re-edited because it just starts in the middle. I'm like, no, you don't get it. We pick out like a juicy 20, 30, 40 minute segment from within the body and we put it in the front before the pre-roll. Did you ever watch a TV show where they jump right into the action before they roll the opening credits? It's a it's exactly the same idea. So you're trying to win over the person's attention to stick around long enough to give you a shot. Yeah, and that's such that's such a good tactic, especially especially for social, especially if you like talking to people on LinkedIn, getting that little juicy bit up front, and then people it could be something that's either got shock value or something that just kind of go like makes people go whoa. And if you put that right at the beginning, they're going to get you're going to get that engagement track because people want to know what's led to that point being made or what's led to that person saying that. And it's just such, it's old school, but it's so overlooked and it's got very much a, a place in B2B video marketing still. It's very, it's, you know, it's, it's so old school that there's some really good analogies. It's to me very similar to the experiments that you'd run like on the subject line of an email campaign, like we're split testing two different subject lines or like a Google ad, we were split testing two different headlines there to see which one gets the higher click or the better conversion rate. It's the same kind of thing is that you can play with like, okay, I think there's three or four really awesome segments in this long form video. Let me try different versions of that, either in short form or as the uh, bumper up front and see what really pops. Yeah, yeah, I, I, exactly. And I'm, I'm, all, I'm all for and anything AB testing, I'm always or for it across marketing, not just video uh, specifically, but anything that you can do, do those controlled control tests and not changing too much, going too crazy. And we do A-B tests with um, with our clients from a video perspective. It could even be A-B testing the thumbnail. Like yeah. we're seeing that people are watching the video, we're getting good engagement rates of 75% plus, but the play rate is 4%. It's like, why is that? Are people not scrolling down to it? Right. Let's start working this through this methodically over the next couple of weeks and figure out what's actually happening and getting some real traffic to it so we can see what, what what's happening. So, yeah, there's there's, there's, lo there's loads you can do from an A-B test point of view, and you can do a fair bit with video as well. And what do you think is the biggest mistake that people make when they're getting started with or been running video for uh, B2B digital marketing for quite some time? Um. I think sometimes you, you've got you've got you've got to look at your performance and basically are you happy with your performance? If you're not happy with what's been performing, you do obviously need to do something different, experiment with different um, with different types of content, and, and and really and really understand what people want. Recently, we, we've been working with a client and the content was performing. The previous content that they had was performing okay, and so we're working from a strategic angle. And it's just like. Right, what we found out and what's performing well in your in, in, in the market at the moment is behind the scenes videos. People want to see behind people want to see behind the curtain. So that was one of the suggestions. And those things necessarily don't have to be a high production value. They're expected to be a little bit grainy, a little bit gritty, and it's a one-man run and gun type type scenario. And that that proved really, really well from them and increased their engagement massively. So by showing by doing a little bit behind the scenes of what's happening when they're installing um in, installing something physical at a, a client's office they could see that and, and then just know what's going on you just feel a bit closer to it so i guess the thing is is is, is have a look at what content if, if you're not happy have a look at what content is performing out there have a look at content that you yourself might want to engage with and start brainstorming ideas and come up with um again something we work with clients it's almost like a a test plan of content work through it keep it really simple keep it top level idea generation think about where it's going to sit in the buy stage journey and create a big list of what content you could create and start to prioritize 
that start prioritize it by a budget or prioritize it by how easy it is to get that content out there. And so that's what I would do. If your video content's not performing, start generating some ideas and start working through an experimental list to get you going. I mean, the, the reason why I say that is there could be 101 things that you're not doing right with video. And so you, you could get into like the nitty gritty of saying, do this, change that, change that. But that's a good idea to kind of jump start it if you're feeling a little bit stale and you feel things are a little bit flat with your video marketing. That's just a good way just to get the relevant people involved and, and, and jump start um, jump start how you can move forward and how you can improve on what you've done so far. I think that fits in really nicely too with understanding the audience and understanding your existing client base, like understanding the problems they're grappling with, the goals they're trying to achieve, understanding why a client hires your company in the first place, that whole idea of the job to be done, of really understanding what business you're in and then making sure that you're aligning all your content investments to help support that. So it's seen, so video ultimately is seen as a sales related investment as opposed to just a marketing investment. So it's something that carries through the whole buyer's journey and even beyond. It's possible to, you can find that customers that watch videos pre-sales may end up being more successful post-sales because there was something that they were learning. Um, that's probably a whole yeah. separate conversation too, is the value of using uh, video post-purchase for customer success and customer service and helping to train and uh, yeah and I think this I think there's so like video content can be used at so many different stages of the journey it is it is unreal what you could use a video for and it's not just about necessarily marketing outwards you could be working on your internal culture you could be working on recruitment films so it's not necessarily pure from a pure marketing point of view uh, where video helps and I think one of the biggest things that we that that we do and it comes back to the like the idea generation is prioritize that because you could do video at every single stage and do great high quality video but that's not feasible with those budgets that we mentioned that are always being cut so by prioritizing the biggest impact that you can make and that's sometimes hard to figure that out what it can be done where can you make the biggest impact and then start from there prove a video use case that video is important to your business and then, and, then, and then go from there. We did it recently with a um, with a with a SaaS client, a SaaS platform, where the biggest impact we could make to their business wasn't creating video to help them sell more. It was to onboard clients. And what it did, it allowed us to onboard onboard seven hundred people all at once, as opposed to having to fly to the location, send a team there to do it, and then spending several days doing it. it allowed a much more cost efficient way. And for a SaaS company, you want scalability. So by investing in onboarding content, that that gave them that scalability that if they were to win XYZ clients, that they could easily onboard them and, and maintain them. So it's always looking about where in that journey can you make the biggest impact with video? And it's, it's, it's I say sometimes it's not necessarily where you think, a lot of people think front end but once past sale, once once you pass the point of winning a customer, a client, there's a hell of a lot more that you can do to to improve your business and your business efficiency. Yeah, I mean, for any kind of SaaS business where recurring revenue and retention and busting churn is so critical, that they're, they're missing an enormous opportunity if they're not looking at what can be done to more efficiently onboard and retain clients using this. I look one of my favorite examples is watching the phenomenal success of HubSpot Academy and what that's done for that particular business and all of the people that have learned from and emulated that in the, in the SaaS space over the last 5, 10, 15 years. And just, yeah. It's quite it's funny kind of, you say that because HubSpot is one, when I'm, when I'm trying to explain it to someone and there's obviously different ways we can go about onboarding content, I always use HubSpot as like the, uh, like the gold standard for it because it's really simple, digestible. It's broken down into those topics that we mentioned before. Um, you can even speed it up as well. That sounds like a silly thing, but you can even speed it up if you feel that you want to bust through the content or slow it down so you can really understand it. HubSpot are like I say, the, the gold standard of, of what on, onboarding and the training content should be. I mean, for a SaaS company too, that has any kind of channel partner program where they're trying to train bars, integrators, partners, consultants, similar to how they would train their internal team. They may think of creating videos to train their internal employees, but they can also repurpose the same content to train channel partners. There's people too that you use video for HR uh, issues yeah. that have a hard time 
uh, with recruiting, or maybe they want somebody to watch a background or in between when they fill out a job application and the interview. And wouldn't it be cool if you knew which candidates actually watched the whole background or and which didn't? And would that help you make better decisions on who to interview? Yeah, and then, and, and 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 that's what I say about how much you can use it throughout the 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 entire uh, the entire business. And you made a good point there about video serving multiple uh, purposes. And I think that's why it's very important to look at your marketing plan holistically. And we always try and get clients to think when we want to create video, where do we envision video being used? Because I see my job as whatever content we're going to create, it needs to work as hard as possible. It needs to be multi-purpose use. And if we, if we can see that bigger, bigger picture and say we're recording on site for the launch of a new product, I can also make sure I'm going to get an interview um, with the engineering lead because what we're going to do, what we're going to do, create later. We're going to that person is going to be part of a recruitment video, and then they talk about the opportunities that are available within this company. So by getting that holistic view, you're saving that person a lot of time. You're saving yourself a lot of time and effort as well by capturing it all. But by spending all the time front on making sure you've got that strategic overview, it just allows you to be a lot smarter with video because it is a significant investment. It is probably one of the biggest things in the marketing mix in terms of content creation that you could that you could spend money on. So it's all about making sure, I say for me, I understand that. And it's always about making sure that works as hard as possible for, 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 for our clients, really. Yeah, I, I think there's, for the different purposes, it's oftentimes really helpful to think of who the intended audience is with the persona. And then internally, it's that whole cultural thing of getting the company to see themselves as thought leaders and subject matter experts and people feeling comfortable being on camera and one of the silver linings of what we've gone through for the last year and a half is I think there's millions of people now that feel way more comfortable having a conversation like this as the yeah. starting point for creating video content and maybe it's a lot more relaxed and a lot more chill than it would have been in the past and easier to get multiple stakeholders involved in providing that kind of expertise for the content. Yeah and, and I think I think one of the one of the big things that we did see from companies is that they want to obviously make great video and they want it to be highly polished. But I think sometimes for certain types of content, there's a tolerance for the, for the quality. And we've seen that more recently with just some light internal um, brand culture videos. We're starting to see that lower, that, that lower, lower production quality where it might be handheld shot on an iPhone or it's like me and you talking, but that's a lot more acceptable these days and I don't see that as a as a bad thing because it means more people can be using video to to achieve whatever objectives is set out and obviously there's still very much a, a place for that high quality high polish um content on there but when you start breaking it down you can get away with more content like this and we did something similar where um we hosted a webinar that that Brexit piece I was on about earlier towards the end of it once it was set in stone what was happening we had a um, we had a webinar, and that was obviously just people sat at home with the webcams. But that generated over seven hundred sign ups, seven hundred new leads that the business could work with, and it had a hell of a lot of views afterwards because we were track we obviously recorded it and was tracking it on Wistia, and so we could see the amount of people that that had impacted. And all it was was a conversation like this. And again, that's the power of it. People will watch it if it's got some value, and they are willing to look the other way as long as it's not really grainy and audio is terrible or anything like that as long as it's clear and you can see what the person's talking through or or showing what they put on their screen I, th I, th I think you are golden with certain types of communication yeah I, I think that's a really interesting byproduct of where we are now also is that there will always be certain places in the buyer's journey there'll be a, a buyer persona of extreme strategic value where it's worth investing quite a bit on a single video but then early on in the awareness stage where you look at like a recurring podcast series where you're filming an episode a couple times a month or a couple times a week or you just if you were to apply the same kind of mindset and same kind of production value you'd produce four episodes a year whereas most people may want to get to the point where they're producing four episodes a month or four episodes a week five episodes a week um so yeah it's just it's a different mindset of all that stuff of understanding the purpose and how long it's supposed to last and even just the concept of evergreen versus non-evergreen content i think is a lot of times completely new for many people yeah, definitely. And I say if, if it is going to be a flagship bit of evergreen content, that's where you would allocate most of your budget. But if it is going to be this, if it's going to be a weekly podcast, 
you can definitely this 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 kind of quality is is what you'd expect if it was really polished it would be strange if there was really high production value to to um to a podcast it would be quite it'd be quite peculiar it looks like you're trying too hard so yeah i think it i think it suits really really well for um i'll say what we're doing right now that's the whole behind the scenes idea of the authenticity and it being a little bit rough around the edges and like almost feeling like reality tv exactly exactly like you, like you are almost like sat there in the virtual room with them that's cool so the final area i wanted to ask you about today andy is where do you see all of this headed next do you see something going on right now where we're going to look back 12 18 24 months from now and feel like this was just a there was something going on that was going to be a massive inflection point that changed everything going forward with how companies use video for b2b marketing and sales um i'm not too sure to be honest i'm I'm quite excited to see to, to see where it's going to go. I think there'll be, um, I think there'll be bigger. I think there'll be more data points that we can that we can track uh, in general and from a marketing, also from a video point of view. I think there'll be hyper personalization. Obviously, you're seeing that more B two C stuff, but B two B that'll be in there. So, a hyper targeted video or hyper targeted um, ad campaigns that are specific for that audience. We're getting richer audience insights. And I think you'll see some technology driving experiences on as well from a, I would like, I probably would see augmented reality and, and virtual reality start to take more of a central, um, a central place. Say so you're, you're a company that makes, um, that, ma that makes something for another business to be able to almost visualize what that product might look like in a VR world, hold it, move it around, have a look at it those types of things we, we, we start to see i think we're going to start to see a big difference in that and i think the people first to that are going to offer a, a quite a unique experience to to what anyone else is doing above, above and beyond their competitors so i could be completely wrong on that but the tech's starting to get there it's starting to become more viable that you've got that but i definitely think augmented reality um will kick off with with, with vr still to follow and i think as the world opens up more anyway, when you go to events and the likes, I think, I think that's where VR might, might really come into it because you, you, you're reducing any barriers to, to the tech then. And just to show people around, if you've got a, a project plant or anything like that, you want to show them, say you're a car manufacturer and you want to walk um, people through what's actually happening on the plant. Uh, it's probably a bad idea. That's probably a bad, uh, bad thing because there's so many secret <laughs> things you can't want. But if you want to showcase to a perspective um client what's actually happening and I, I think i think that's what's going to happen um but yeah who who knows i say i'm quite excited what's going to happen and i think the best thing the best thing anyone can do with it from a b2b marketing point of view is just constantly stay curious and stay open stay open-minded about what's going to happen because things will be changing you've got to adapt to it you've got to be agile you've got to be willing to learn it and you've got to and you've got to do that to constantly make sure you're ahead. And say with those reduced budgets that we're seeing, you need to be not only working hard, but working smart as well. It seems all of this will potentially give a business a competitive edge, a sense of differentiation. If you think about the emotional impact that a video asset can have compared to a print asset, augmented reality, virtual reality is like they're living within the video. They're experiencing it. It's the next best thing to feeling like in the same way video can make someone feel like they know you and which helps with the know, like, and trust. The AR and the VR gets them to experience what it's like to be a customer and live in this world already. Exactly. Yeah. And that's just going to open up so many possibilities of how you can push your product, whether it's, <laughs> <coughs> sorry. So that's going to, that's going to change how you how how you basically people perceive your product or your service and it allows them to ship so so you are so you are a service platform you can you can use like a, the virtual reality world to kind of take them on the journey of let's say you're a data company and you're all about data validation or basically making sure um people's data quality on their on the on the marketing front is is correct and also safe to use you could take them through that and almost be like a little electron whizzing round and showing all this automation that's happening to make sure your data quality is high. There's things like that, things that are very hard to put down in words or to show in a very flat world by putting them physically in there and showing them around. I think there's, as you said, it's going to be a unique experience. It's going to give competitive edge, a competitive edge and um, 
yeah, I say that's what I think. I could be completely wrong, but I think maybe I might be out by two, two another additional two years. But it'd be good to at least to see start that start coming through and some very cutting edge businesses leading the way of how it's done. That's terrific. Thank you so much, Andy, for joining me today. You've been hearing from Andy Young from Skeleton in Nottingham in the UK. Uh, Andy, I know you're active on LinkedIn and I'll be sure to include a link to that in the show notes along with this podcast. Um, what's the best way for someone to learn more about the work that Skeleton does? Yeah, so if you go to our website, which is skeletonproductions.com, you can see some of the great work we do there. And um, but if there's something in particular that you that you want to see or a particular style or some of the great um, strategic work we've done for all the clients that we might not necessarily be able to uh, put on the website, you can always drop me an email at andy.young at skeletonproductions.com. And uh, I'm always happy to have a, have a chat and, and, and talk through video. Well, thanks so much, Andy. I wish you all the best and look forward to seeing year two years out from the road, how many of our predictions panned out well, but it's very clear that video is going to be a core part of what's going to help businesses grow, differentiate and thrive and just have a better customer experience going forward. Yeah, definitely. Thanks very much for having me, Joshua. Thank you, Andy. Take care now. Thanks for listening to this episode of the B2B Digitized Podcast. To subscribe and leave a review, check us out at b2bdigitized.com or wherever you like to consume podcast episodes, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and YouTube.